church, we're moving onward in our study of Hosea. So if you would get your Bible and open it to the book of Hosea, we're going to be in Hosea chapter 4. We're calling the series, if you remember, Uncomfortable Love Songs. Uncomfortable Love Songs. We're calling that for a few reasons. The first reason is that as Hosea is a love song from God to his people, there are sections in here that that are going to make us uncomfortable because of the way that God approaches how he expresses his love. It's not this this lovey-dovey kind of everything is wonderful, rainbows and kittens and walking in a field of daisies. Sometimes love looks like saying hard things to people that you do love and sometimes that's necessary and so this is that's part of this is that sometimes this is kind of uncomfortable for us but then also we're looking at the way that the world looks at love and and it, it's i mean it's dead wrong so we've looked at it a, a few times now but i'm going to tell the story of how the world sees love and looks at love through some of the songs these love songs from the last like 50 60 years And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at that this morning. We're going to contrast what the world thinks about love with how God looks at love and his definition of love. But I want to look at a song this morning, one song, but with multiple different people singing it. The songs have the same title, but they could not be more different. I'm going to put some lyrics up on screen just so that you can see. The first side over here, Anita Baker, 1986, wrote this song called Same Old Love. Okay, Selena Gomez, 2015. Same title of a song, completely different lyrics. Let me read some of these lyrics. You can see them on the screen. Anita Baker sang this in 1986. From beginning to end, 365 days of the year, I want your same old love. Isn't that beautiful? That sounds to me like two people have been married for 50 years and they're like, I didn't grow tired of you. I still love you. I still want your same old love. Now look at the other side, okay? This is Selena Gomez, 2015, and this is what she says. I'm not spending any time... Wasting tonight on you. I'm sick of that same old love. Okay. <laughs> You've got two people writing the same, the same title of a song, but they could not be more different. On this side, it's, uh, you're looking at, uh, something, uh, about faithfulness and consistency in a relationship. On the other side, you've got a person talking about infidelity and broken relationships. Same title, completely different songs, completely different lyrics. But listen, both of them kind of fail in their core premise when they talk about love. Because both of them kind of come at it with this idea or this purpose that you can find true fulfillment in love with another person. So that, that's kind of the, the premise of both of these songs is if you find the right person, then you'll be truly fulfilled. But the true truth about this, about love in general, church, is that people can never fulfill you. Now, we were created to live in community, and we were created, a man was created to join together with a woman and, and have a relationship and build a family that glorifies and honors the Lord, okay? But people will always let you down. People will always fail you. They will always disappoint you. Now, not my wife. My wife will always do the opposite, so that's, that's just going to throw that in there. But, but the truth is we're broken and we're sinners, and so we can never find true fulfillment outside of the person of Jesus Christ. And so the Bible's definition of love looks like this. It's the patient, faithful, sovereign, unconditional goodwill and affection of a holy God toward his people. Church, that's what we need this morning. That's what we need. That's the thing that will truly fulfill. You were created this morning. The reason why you are here and the reason why you draw breath and exist is to walk in relationship with your creator. And God has made a way for that to happen through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now, what we're going to see this morning in our text in Hosea chapter 4 is that we're going to see a a legal term. We're going to see some legal terms. We're going to see a trial happen. We're going to see God put his people on trial He's going to put his people on the stand. He's going to offer some evidence against them for their guilt and their sin and their rebellion. And church, if you're not careful, if you're not, if you're not reading this in context, this doesn't look like love. But the truth is, God exposes sin in his people because he loves them. He wants to draw you back into a relationship with him to heal, to restore, and to bring us back to him. So that's what we're going to see this morning. If you would stand with me. We're going to be in Hosea 4, and I'm going to start by just reading the first three verses. And we're going to move through the rest of the chapter, but I want to just start in the first three verses. Now, my goal, just as by way of uh, just explanation for all this, I want to hit on every verse in the, the book of Hosea, but we don't have enough time to focus 
and really dig deep into every verse. So really what you're going to see is this is more of an overview. We're going to cover every chapter, and I want you to see the big themes. Uh, but you know me, I, 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 I want to touch on every verse. I wish I could, but at some point we, we do have to conclude for today. So we're going to cover just chapter 4, and I'm going to look at, look at it from 30,000 feet. I want to see the big picture of what's happening here. Let's read the first three verses to start. Everybody there say amen? Got me, okay. I'm in Hebrew, uh, Hebrews, Hosea chapter 4. We'll be in Hebrews next, so that's, that's where I'm, I'm studying both books at the same time, and it can get confusing. Hosea 4, 1. Hear the word of the Lord, people of Israel. For the Lord has a case against the inhabitants of the land. There is no truth, no faithful love, and no knowledge of God in the land. Church, that may be one of the the saddest verses in Scripture. There is no truth. There is no faithful love. There is no knowledge of God in the land. Cursing, lying, murder, stealing, and adultery are rampant. One act of bloodshed follows another. For this reason, the land mourns, and everyone who lives in it languishes, along with the wild animals and the birds of the sky. Even the fish of the sea disappear. Now, it goes on, and I'm going to continue, but for now, I just want to read those three verses to get us started, and then we'll, we'll keep moving on. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning and ask his blessing over this time. Father, we approach you with, with reverence and sincerity. We, we know that we are sinners, and the only reason that we can pray and seek your face is because Christ has made a way. He has torn the veil between a sinful people and a holy God. And we thank you that through him and through his sacrifice we can enter back into a relationship with you. We can be restored. We can be redeemed. We can be saved. And it is not because of what we do. It is not acts or works of righteousness that we have done, but it is by your sacrifice that we can be saved. And so we praise you this morning. We sang songs of praise. And we, I pray, Lord, that your heart was pleased in what we, what we sang this morning. I pray as we study your word that you would reveal your truth to us, Lord, we ask the Holy Spirit, who was the, the inspiration of these words, the, that, that you would come and be our teacher and our counselor this morning. We love you and we thank you. I pray, Lord, uh, for our congregation as we gather around your word, that you would feed your people and you would bless your people. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, church, you see where I'm going with this? We're looking at a trial. We're on trial in this chapter. God is going to use some legal terms, and I wanted to kind of walk through it in this way. So number one, if you're following along your notes, is this. How do you start a trial? You go with an opening statement. You make opening statements. Now, a couple of things are going to happen here, okay? In a normal trial, help me out. Who are the different people involved in a normal legal trial? The defendant, okay? Prosecutor. Jury. Judge, okay, that's all we're going to do. You could keep going and be like bailiff, custodian, stenographer. Like You could do all those, but th- those, those four people are typically involved. Now, in this trial, though, we're not seeing all of those pieces. There's going to be some glaring differences here. There's no jury, okay? There is a judge. Who is the judge? God is the judge. The Lord is the judge. There is a defendant. Who is the defendant? Well, we'll see that in a little bit, but largely the people of Israel are on trial here. Uh, there is no prosecutor. Uh, the Lord kind of serves as both prosecutor and judge in this, in this case. And he comes out of the gate guns blazing, church. He doesn't hold anything back. So now I don't know much about trials. I've been, how many of y'all have been called for a jury and you've sat on a jury? Like you've actually gone through a trial? Man, that's crazy. Was it fun or did you not? Did you like it? Do you not? Did you enjoy it? Not interesting, okay? I, 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 let's, I, I'm, I'm intrigued now. Has anybody ever had like a murder case and you were a juror on a murder case? Wow! Okay, I need to have a conversation with Johnny. Maybe we can meet for lunch this week and we can talk a little bit about that. I'd like to hear about that. I have never been called. I don't know what it's like. I've never been sued. I've never gone to court because I've committed a crime. I don't, I don't, I've, I've committed sin, just not crime. So we, we can talk about that at another point. Johnny and I will talk this week. But so I've never done that. So I, I wanted to get a little bit more information about what, what, what it looked like. So I asked one of our members, Nicole, is a federal judge. And so I, I just uh, kind of texted with her this week and I said, in an opening statement, what's, what's, what's the goal? What would you, as the judge, what do you want to hear in, in an opening and closing statement? And, and so this is what she wrote me this week. I thought this was really good. Just kind of summarize. She said, for opening statement, the mo- for the most part, the most important part, is for the lawyer to tell the story of the case. Be factual 
and what he or she expects to prove. And then closing argument, it's time to be persuasive and argue the case. So the beginning of the trial, you just, as the prosecutor, you just want to come and say, here's my evidence and this is what I want to accomplish. And the closing, you're going to say, why? Like, this is the reason why you want to be persuasive. What's really neat, she didn't know the context of what I was teaching when she said that. Uh, she didn't know the passage or anything like that. And what we see is that God follows that pattern pretty closely in, in the text. And so I think that was a, a neat thing in, in how this all worked out. But we see the Lord follow this pattern. And so he starts here with this really just factual, fact-based, convincing, convicting opening statement against his people. He says, there is no truth, there is no faithful love, There is no knowledge of God in the land. Cursing, lying, murder, stealing, and adultery are rampant. One act of bloodshed follows another. You notice one glaring difference in this versus the trial today is there's no defense. There's no legal team. There's no people standing and saying objection because there are no objections to this church. Because the righteous judge, the one who is perfect and holy and just, is standing up saying... It's not my opinion that these things have happened. It is true fact that these things are happening among the people that are supposed to be my people. He is ultimately righteous and truthful and perfect. And I want you to see the whole point of this case that we're on, this trial that we're in, is not just to prosecute offenders, but it's to convince his own people of their sin, their need for repentance and restoration. So look at his accusation here, okay? He says, there is no truth. No faithful love and no knowledge of God in the land. Think about those three things. Truth, love, and knowledge. Those are pretty foundational to any, to any organization or any group that would call themselves the people of God. So superimpose this into 2023. What if God brought an accusation against our church? Okay, Just follow me here for a second. What if God came and said, among the members of First Baptist Church of Van, there is no faithful love for the Lord. There is no biblical truth being taught. There is no knowledge of God that is increasing. Talk to me, church. Is, is that a legitimate church then? How could it be? If you're missing three foundational elements of what it means to be the people of God and to know God, to say, you don't even know anything about me, you're not communicating truth, and you have no love for me. This is, this is a scary moment for God to bring this to his people. You couldn't even rightly call it a church. These are foundational building blocks. You ever play the game Jenga? You ever play with one of those people that want to take all the blocks from the bottom Have you seen those people? They want to stack all of the whole tower on that one little piece. You're like, come on, man. You've weakened the whole structure. That's what's happening here. These people, by removing these key pieces of what it means to be the people of God, they've removed, they've weakened the whole structure. This is a serious accusation. They are the people of God, but they're not acting like it. They're the people of God, really, at this point, in name only. They're the people of God because God has declared them to be and because he has been faithful to them. But he says, listen, there is, you've lost all sense of what it means to walk in relationship with the Lord. My prayer this morning, church, is some serious heart check. Why are you here this morning? Why, why did you wake up? Why did you let that alarm wake you up this morning? Why did you get ready? Why did you get dressed? Why did you get your kids ready? Why did you come to this place what, what was your motivation? Is it just because this is what I do on Sundays? This, this is that we go for an hour and then we go to the dinner bell. We try to beat those Methodists to the dinner bell. Like what, what, what is your purpose here? Because if you're missing these three things, then it is time for you to get into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it doesn't happen because one day I, I just want, I want to be saved. It happens when the Holy Spirit moves and leads you to him. So this morning, do some heart check. These people would have fully called themselves the people of God. Israel would have said, we are God's people. He's not going to do anything to us because we we were in a covenant with him. But they have forgotten what it means to walk in relationship with the Lord. No truth, no love, no knowledge. Look what this leads to in verse two. Cursing, lying, murder, stealing, and adultery. One act of bloodshed follows another. Cursing, lying, murder, stealing, adultery. Say it with me, church. Cursing, lying, stealing, murder, adultery. You didn't say it. I know that was fast. 
That's the third, ninth, sixth, eighth, and seventh of the Ten Commandments. What's God communicating here? You've broken all of my law. Every single thing there is to do, you have, you have broken it in every point. A lack of biblical truth, a lack of faithful love, and a lack of the knowledge of God will always lead people into deeper and deeper sin. When you take those things away, when you, when you say, I'm going to stop receiving biblical truth, I'm going to stop expressing faithful and devoted love to the Lord. I'm going to stop growing in my knowledge of God. It's going to lead you into deeper and deeper sin. Adrian Rogers famously said, this book will keep you away from sin or sin will keep you away from this book. One or the other. Today, I'm going to be honest with you, today when a church fails to communicate God's truth, they fail to encourage faithful love to the Lord, and they fail to promote the knowledge of God, I guarantee you that church is full of rampant, unrepentant sin. That's what happens. When you remove those elements, the whole thing comes crashing down. So God brings his opening statement here. It's, it's damning. It's, it's alarming that the people of God could get to a point where he says, you have no knowledge of me. And that brings us forward into the New Testament when there's going to be people that get to the end of their life and they're going to stand before the Lord and they're going to look at him and and say, look at all the things that I did for you. Look at all the wonderful miracles. Look at all the things I did. I was so faithful. I did all these things. And what is he going to say if they don't know him? They're going to say, he's going to look at him and say, but you, I don't know you. You did not walk in relationship with me. I, I don't even know who you are. You weren't my child. So God brings his opening statement. It's just pure fact. This is the spiritual condition of where the people are. Number two, let's identify the defendant. There is a defendant in this case. Let's identify who it is. All right, let's uh, let's read a little bit, but I want you to see all of Israel is guilty of all of these sins. So uh, rightly, all of them are on the stand. But God in this section is going to single out a specific group of people. It's Israel's spiritual leaders. Israel's spiritual leaders. Let's read starting in verse verse 4. I love how he starts this. Let no one dispute. Let no one argue. He's saying, listen, even if you could object, you have nothing to object to. This is all true and you know it. So he says, let no one dispute. Let no one argue. For my case is against whom? The priests. You priests. You will stumble by day. The prophet will also stumble with you by night, and I will destroy your mother. Okay, just quick aside here, okay? Aren't you glad that this worked out where this was our text for this week and not next week? I'm not sure I could, uh, I, I could rightly do that, uh, preach a text that says I will destroy uh, your mother on Mother's Day. That might be a little too far. But he, he, God, God is speaking truthfully. He's, he's saying you have, you have destroyed your own people. Because look at this next verse. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge. I will reject you from serving as my priest since you've forgotten the law of your God. I will also forget your sons. The more they multiply, the more they sin against me. I will change their honor into disgrace. They feed on the sin of my people. They have an appetite for their iniquity. The same judgment will happen to both people and priests. I will punish them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. They will eat but not be satisfied. They'll be promiscuous, but not multiply. For they have abandoned their devotion to the Lord. All right, look, so all of Israel is guilty of these sins. He says here, the same judgment will fall on both people and priests. But he's singling out the priests specifically. And there's no argument that can be made to Almighty God that could salvage this situation. Why do you think he's singling out the priests and not just directing this toward the people? What is it about the priests that are significant in in talking about Israel's spiritual life? Yeah. Yeah. I hear you, and I know you're speaking in your heart. You just don't like to speak in church. How many of y'all grew up in a church where, or grew up in church where you weren't supposed to talk in church? Okay. Most of you, you're like, okay, I feel super uncomfortable talking. Listen, when I invite you to talk, it's okay. Like, I, I want this to be a, a conversation in and around God's word. But, but look at this. The priests, their whole role was to guide the people spiritually. And so if you come to a place where the people had no knowledge, they had no truth, they had no faithful love for the Lord, it starts with the spiritual leadership. 
It means they were not doing their job. It means they, they, they were not uh, fulfilling their responsibility. Let's talk about the two roles that the priests had, the two main roles that the priests had in Israel. Number one, they, they offered the sacrifices on behalf of the people. So they would, they would collect sacrifice, the, the animals from the people, they would sacrifice them on the altar, and they would bring atonement to the people through that sacrifice. This wasn't just like, oops, I feel bad, and I, here's, a, you know, here's a, few, a, a few sheep, and, and let's just make things right. The sacrificial system was the act of obedience that showed Israel's devotion to the Lord. And the priests were the key part in offering those sacrifices. It it, it proved their, their love and their devotion to the Lord. The second thing that they were supposed to be doing is teaching people the law. They were supposed to be doing this. So for there to be no knowledge of God and no truth being communicated, what does that tell you about these priests? They weren't doing their job. They weren't doing anything. It says, they, they, uh, what does it say here in verse 6? You've rejected knowledge. You don't even believe the things. Even if you did teach them, you don't believe it. You've rejected this. And then it says, you've forgotten the law of your God. One, one of the crazy things that we see here, so we, we see a failure in the priesthood here, but if you fast forward in Scripture a hundred years, you're going to see a complete turnaround. So whatever God is doing here in this moment is going to make a difference in the people. Because in a hundred years, there's going to be a priest named Ezra who rises up and he teaches the people. And in Ezra chapter 8, there's this awesome, awesome passage where all the the Levites and the priests get together. They build this big stand. They stand all day long gathering the people together and they read the entirety of God's law. So Genesis through Deuteronomy, they read all of it and it doesn't stop there because then they go among the people and they gather little groups and they say, well, do you, do you know, do you know what this passage means? And they go and it says all the priests were going around explaining the law to all the people. And it culminates in this beautiful moment of repentance and worship and sacrifice to the Lord. It, this is, that's what the priesthood was intended to be. This, this beautiful group of people who are leading the people to sacrifice and, and pointing them ultimately to Jesus Christ and then teaching the law. That's not happening here. It's a complete failure on the part of the priests. Not only are they not leading the people, but they're actively participating in the people's sin. Look what it says in verse 8. They feed on the sin of my people. They have an appetite for their iniquity. Remember we talked about last week the symbol of their idolatry was their love for a specific food. You remember what it was? The raisin cakes. They love their raisin cakes. They made these, these delicacies that they would offer to other gods. And that was indicative of their, of their relationship to the Lord. But we see here... God says, this is, this is the end result. This is what you're doing. When you fail in your responsibility, these priests, this is what's happening. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. All right, I'm going to be real with you for a second, and I'm going to maybe step on some toes, and I'm going to be okay with that. Every single day, I see online somewhere, either a member of our church or a member of churches in our area, sharing or following or, or liking a false teacher on on some sort of social media, okay? And I'm not going to call names. I'm not going to do any of that, but I want you to, I, I just, I want to stop for a second because look at what happens. Look at what happens to the people of God when they begin to forsake the, the, the truth of God being communicated, the knowledge of God being multiplied, and the love of God being encouraged. The internet has just compounded. There's always been false teachers since the beginning. The majority of the New Testament was written in response to false teachers infiltrating the church. There's always been false teachers, but the internet has compounded it. it, it there are so many wolves with YouTube channels, I, you can't even count them. They're everywhere. Uh, there, there, there's foolish people who do not understand what they're doing, standing up and peddling theological garbage, and Christians by the thousands are eating it up because they want to be told how to live their best life. Church, I, I, I'm, I'm going to beg of you this morning, please be discerning and be careful on who you're listening to. Please be careful. Don't just, don't just look for teachers and say, well, they make me feel good and they make me feel positive and they tell me how to live my best life. And I go away from their sermons just feeling like a big old hug from the Lord. Listen, many of them are leading you to destruction. Here's some questions to answer and ask. If you're, if you're looking to listen to somebody online or listen to somebody on the TV, here's some questions that I want you to, to ask. Are they faithful to the biblical text? 
Are they faithful to the biblical text? You know the only way you can answer that question is if you know the biblical text. You can't know. I mean, you can be listening to someone and you can say, now 90% of that is, is awesome. 90% of that is true. But that 10%, Paul Washer said recently, is doctrines of demons. So we, we look at this. Are they faithful to the biblical text? Are they committed to teaching the word of God in context? I want to tell a story on Chloe, okay? She doesn't know I'm going to do this. And she's looked at me like deer in the headlights right now. Uh, she's been doing a little devotional Bible study every night with Mindy. And they've just been kind of going through this, this little devotional. And it's awesome. I've seen her taking notes and all that. Well, on, the, on, on one of her pages of notes, uh, it, she wrote real big in there, context. And I was like, yeah, that's right. This is how we teach God's word. I don't pull a verse out of context and make it say what I want it to say, but we study the scripture in context. So with the person you're listening to, are they teaching in context? Are they giving the history of this? It, 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 does, does it matter to you? Because if it doesn't, we're going to make the word of God say what we want it to, and we're going to twist it. And that's what false teachers excel at, because they want your money. That's what they want. That's what they're after. And so look at this and say, are, are they teaching the word in context? The third question that you can ask is this. Does their doctrine follow what you know to be true about the word of God? Does their doctrine follow? Again, how do you answer that question? You've got to know doctrine. You've got to know theology. And so when, I, when you look at this, I, 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 it's, it's very easy to look and say, well, that preacher makes me happy. That preacher tells funny jokes. That preacher does these, these big, huge, they, he does these sets on stage and they look so cool. And, and that's why I follow them. But church, ask those questions. MacArthur said this, if you're looking for a pastor, look for one who glorifies God above all. Let me give you some names. You want to you listen to some people this week? Let me give you some names. John MacArthur has faithfully preached the word of God for 50 years at one church. Vody Bauckham, Paul Washer. You want to get some conviction in your life this week? Put on a Paul Washer sermon and then call me afterwards. H.B. Charles, man, he can open the word of God and outline it like no one else I've ever seen. James White, you want to know a man who's committed to the original languages and knowing God's word intimately? James White. Jeff Durbin, man, he can preach boldly in the face of uh, of our modern uh, society. Mike Winger. If you want to look for a YouTube guy, Mike Winger. He, he opens the Word of God consistently. He has a 150-part sermon series in the book of Mark. That's the level of detail that he goes into. Alistair Begg. Man, he's one on the radio, consistently preaches the truth. One I've been listening to a, a lot lately that I would recommend. His name is Armin Tomasian. Armin Tomasian is a preacher in Greenville, South Carolina. All of these people are going to have one common theme. They're going to preach the word. They're going to preach the word. They're going to come back to the word again and again and again and again. If you're listening to someone and all of a sudden you realize, man, they started in scripture, but they haven't gone back to that scripture since the beginning. They've just been telling stories of their own personal life. Listen, find someone who is devoted. Stay devoted to the word and use discernment. And I'm going to say this too before we move on. No amount of internet preaching or TV preaching can replace the ministry of the local church. So if you're here and you're like, well, I get the majority of my, my teaching online, listen, be very careful. The majority of what you consume in Scripture needs to be you and the Bible and a notebook. Like that, that, that should be the majority of what we consume. Internet preachers and different things, they, sh they should complement that. But you need to spend time in the Word and you cannot forsake the church in the midst of it. There's a lot of people after COVID who said, I can worship in my living room just as well as I can in church. And listen, you can't. You can't. You can't do that. That's not the purpose of the church. You aren't just here to listen to a sermon this morning. That, that's not the only goal. You are gathered together as the body of Christ in this place to, first of all, to sing praises to the one who redeemed you. And we've done that. Man, when we were singing earlier, I love to hear just the resounding sound of everybody in this room singing. We're here gathered for that purpose. We're here to open God's word. Sure, we do that faithfully. We do that biblically. We want to learn and be fed from the word. We exercise our spiritual gifts that we are given. That can only happen in the gathered body of Christ. You can't, you can't exercise your spiritual gifts sitting on your couch watching church online, okay? You, you, we, we gather together to rehearse the gospel and to remember the death of Christ in, in taking communion. We do all these things, and all of them can only happen in the gathered body of Christ. We're going to see here in our text, I'm going to keep moving, it's 11.04, let's go. As the pulpit goes, so goes the nation. 
As the pulpit goes, so goes the nation. You're going to see this again and again. In the Old Testament, as the pulpit went, the nation followed. The priests were fueled by the people's sin, and it became this cycle of of just wickedness and idolatry and rebellion. So number two, we've identified the defendant. Who is this? It's Israel's spiritual leaders. It's the priests. Now, what have they done? Number three, articulating the crime. Let's talk about this. What, What are the charges? What are the charges against them? Idolatry. You can just write that down. This is the one word, idolatry. Israel's idolatry. Let's keep reading verse 11. Promiscuity. That means sexual immorality. Wine and new wine take away one's understanding. Now, we're going to be careful with this, and we are going to talk about it at some point in the future. But listen, uh, this, when it talks about wine and new wine, in and of itself, it's, it's, it's an inanimate object. It's, it's not a sinful thing in and of itself. It's, it's the, the abuse of it that we're talking about here. Again and again and again, in connection with this, it's talking about somebody abusing this to the point of drunkenness, and we're going to talk through that uh, as we go on. But so there's sexual immorality, there's drunkenness. Verse 12, my people consult their wooden idols, and their divining rods inform them. For a spirit of promiscuity leads them astray, and they act promiscuously in disobedience to their God. Their physical immorality is just a symbol of their spiritual immorality that's already happening inside. Verse 13, they sacrifice on mountaintops, they burn offerings on hills and under oaks, poplars, and terebinths, because their shade is pleasant. And so your daughters act promiscuously, and your daughters-in-law commit adultery. Men, you hear that? This is the danger that started with the people of God abandoning biblical truth, and it leads to this, your daughters act promiscuously. This should terrify you. Especially in the world that we live in today. This is the natural result of a lack of biblical truth. It gets deeper and deeper into sin until it's in the next generation and the next generation. Verse 14, I'm not going to punish your daughters when they act promiscuously or your daughters-in-law when they commit adultery. Why? I'm not going to just single them out. Why? Because the end of the verse, for the men themselves, they can't call themselves men. That's my interjection. Because they themselves go off with prostitutes and make sacrifices with cult prostitutes. People without discernment are doomed. It started with a lack of biblical truth, a lack of faithful love, and a lack of expanding knowledge of God. And it's led to this point. Israel, if you act promiscuously, don't let Judah become guilty. Don't go to Gilgal or make a pilgrimage to Beth Do Not swear an oath as the Lord lives. He says, listen, leave, leave Judah alone. They're going to go on their own path in a little bit. But you, you've infected yourself with sin to the point where it, who, the people around you are being infected with it as well. There's a lot here, church, and I wish I could spend some more time. But God is singling out Israel's besetting sin. And that's idolatry. Idolatry. Listen, this is the most loving thing that God can do for his people, to expose and confront their sin. All right, and, and today, you may be sitting here today, and you're like, all I want to hear is about is God's love. Well, maybe God's love for you looks like this, exposing some secret sin in your life. Maybe that's what it looks like. And that's the most loving thing that he can do, because your besetting sins, these paths that you're following, are leading you to hell. Look at these people, man. In verse 13, everything that it was possible to worship... They worshipped. Every place it was possible to worship in, what? They worshipped. Every way in which it was possible to worship, what? They worshipped. Like, it was, it was everything, their whole lives. The sexual immorality, the promiscuity, their, their devotion to idols, all of this. It's, it's, it's this the spiritual reality that they're living in. They were idol worshippers. One thing I want to point out before we move on, verse 13. It lists all these trees, right? They're worshiping under these oaks, these poplars, and these terebinths. Why? Because their shade is, what does your version say? I heard a lot of things, so maybe it's some different words. Mine says pleasant, okay? In Hebrew, it's the word tov, and it means agreeable, desirable, delightful, or pleasant. So they looked at these and they said, that's, that's what I want. That's the area. That's the place I want. That is desirable. That is delightful. That pleases me. That's how Satan presents sin. He's never going to present it as outright corruption because we would turn our nose at it. But he presents it as something that you want and you desire. And you look at that and say, man, that, that looks good. We don't understand how, how rotten this is, though. This word, tov, was used in conjunction with another tree. Anybody want to guess? Yeah. So Genesis chapter 3, man and woman come to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it says they looked at the fruit, and what was it? It was desirable. 
It was delightful. They wanted it, and they took it, and in doing so, they brought sin into all mankind. It's the same word being used about a tree. Centuries change, cultures change in this, but mankind remains the same. And, and, and we are in the same way here, too. They have not changed. I want to remind you in all of this, though, church, God is loving his people by exposing and confronting their sin. He's leading them toward restoration of himself, uh, restoration with himself toward repentance. On the surface, this whole thing, it seems like a trial. It may seem accusatory. It may seem unloving. But the truth is God is holy and just and his judgments are true and they're trustworthy. And with these people, he's being patient and faithful. He's loving them sovereignly and unconditionally. But loving someone doesn't mean turning a blind eye toward their sin. That's what the world thinks. The world says, hey, if you love me, you're not going to call me out. But the truth is, if you love someone, you're going to tell them the truth, and that's what's happening in this text. Number four, God's closing arguments. Remember, Nicole said the point of opening arguments were to be factual, to, to present the information as it is, to present the, what the aims of the trial are. Now, on this side, it's the, the closing argument is meant to be persuasive. It's meant to usually persuade who? Usually persuade the jury, but in this case there is no jury. So God is giving a closing argument to persuade who? He doesn't need to persuade himself. He needs to persuade them that they need to repent. And so look at verses 16 through 19 with me. This is so fun. And Mike Reed, I've been thinking about you all week in, in just in, in verse 16. Not you personally, but just in your profession. Because look at it, it says, Israel is what? As obstinate as a stubborn cow. And I, I bet Mike has dealt with some stubborn cows, Norm. I bet you've dealt with some stubborn cows over the years. But this is not complimentary. I hope that you see this. God is being emotional here. He's, he's, he's looking at his people and he's persuading them. He says, Israel is as obstinate as a stubborn cow. Can the Lord now shepherd them like a lamb in an open meadow? He says, you should have been following me like a sheep. You should have been able to be led like this, but instead you've been stubborn in your sin. Ephraim is attached to idols. Leave them alone. When their drinking is over, they turn to promiscuity. It's all one big cycle of sin. Israel's leaders fervently love disgrace. And here is the end result of what's going to happen to these people. A wind with its wings will carry them off. Or your version may say, because literally in the Hebrew it says, a wind with, with its wings will bind them. And they will be ashamed of their sacrifices. So there's no jury here. God is convincing them of their need for repentance. He says, you've been so stubbornly set on your own way and on your sin. And it ends in verse 19. He's saying, this is the end result of this. This is a prophecy of their exile in Assyria. He's saying, that there, there will be a, a wind that will come and sweep you up and take you away. It will bind you and take you away. This is a prophecy of Israel's exile. The end of the road of sin is always destruction. You with me, church? You can't play around with it. We think, hey, nobody knows. God knows. We think nobody sees. God sees. He calls himself in the book of Genesis, the God who sees. Hebrews chapter 4 says that we are naked before him, the one to whom we must give an account. God's love for his people is right here. If we would see it, he's exposing their sin. He's loving them in the midst of this. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way to death. So this is how God loves his people through this section. He's loving them on every word. He's loving them and leading them away from danger and destruction. He's warning them of the consequences of their sin, and he's presenting his own righteousness as their only hope of salvation. Church, this is the, the story of Scripture, the story of the Gospel, repeated over and over and over. I say the same thing to us today that God said to Israel all these years before. That we need to understand that our sin is leading us toward death. That there are consequences to it. But that He has sent His Son, Jesus Christ, as a way of atonement, as the way, the only way to be saved if we would turn to Him. In Acts 2, Peter said, be saved from this corrupt generation. So church this morning, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, if you've just been going through the motions, if you don't have this, this biblical truth, this faithful love and knowledge of God, if those things are absent in your life, I'm going to beg you to come to Jesus this morning. He is willing. He, he wants to enter into a relationship with you. He has done everything. It, it's not about me meeting Him halfway. He's done all the work, 100% of it. It is His role as Savior 
Won't you come to him today? Won't you repent of your sins and trust in the name of Jesus? He's calling you out of sin and shame into his glorious gift of salvation. Praise team, come up. We're going to sing a song of response. If you don't know Jesus is your Savior, be bold for just a few minutes and come talk to me this morning. And in fact, you don't need me. If you cry out to the Lord right now, ask him to forgive you and ask him to save you, the Lord says that he will save. But if you want more information, you want me to walk through in depth what it means to be saved, I am right here for you. And I'm here every single week for that purpose. Church, if you are saved, you need to look at your life and say, is, is my life mirrored in Israel? this morning? Is this what I look like? When Could God bring these accusations against me and have them stick? If so, it's time for some repentance. So church, let's, let's have a moment of response. Whatever that looks like for you, if you want to come talk to me, if you want to pray with me, I would love to do that. If you'd like to pray by yourself or pray where you are, please do that. But respond in some way. Maybe it's with your voices in this song. We're going to sing this old hymn, beautiful, beautiful classic hymn, Just As I Am. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we love you, Lord, and we are so grateful that you love us enough to confront our sin. That you love us to the degree that you won't let us stay on that path to destruction, but that you redirect us and you bring us back to your own self. I thank you that, Lord, that that we have this opportunity right now to trust in you as our Savior. That while we still draw breath, there is opportunity to be saved. And I I pray, Lord, if somebody in this room hasn't entered into that relationship with you, has not surrendered their heart to you as Lord and Savior, I pray today would be the day of salvation. I pray if there's some people in here dealing with some secret sin that nobody knows about, I pray that today you would confront that, shine a light on that, expose that, and Lord, lead them toward restoration and repentance. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for your words. In Jesus' name, amen.